Hello, my friends, and welcome to Fishery. I'm Alex Williamson, and we are going to be talking about the phosphate cycle. Ooh, exciting, right? A deep dive into phosphorus and phosphates. Now, what's the difference? Well, basically, phosphorus is an element, and it exists on its own as an element, but it doesn't usually exist in nature on its own because it wants to attach to oxygen. It wants four extra elements of oxygen bonded to it just because of its configuration atomically. But we're going to talk about the phosphate and phosphorus cycle in nature and how every living creature in this world and probably other worlds has phosphates or phosphorus as a building block to its existence. We could not make energy grow, move, or metabolize anything, whether we're a tree, a human, a fish, or bacteria, without phosphorus. It is the backbone, it is one of the main components of the universal currency of life and energy, which is a molecule known as ATP. It is the energy source in cells, in all living things. And this is a commonality that goes back to the very first living creatures very first single cell organisms. So it's a big deal. Now also, phosphates are found on the tallest mountaintops and in the deepest of the ocean floors. And they can cause algae blooms, they can cause toxicity. And as I've alluded to, you can't live without them. It's that old saying, you can't live with it and you can't live without it. So in this deep dive, first we're gonna talk a little bit about what it does biologically for humans and in plants and fish on a cellular level and on a chemistry level. Then we're gonna go over the cycle in the wild, in nature, how it runs its course, just like the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle that you may know from the aquarium. And this is a cycle that is going on in our aquarium, but it is much more uh, difficult to finesse uh, for many people than the other cycles because it is something that builds up over time rather than gets extracted out of the aquarium over time. It is part of the total dissolved solids. It is part of your substrate and plants and animals. So anything you put in there, even food, and oftentimes even your water has some phosphates in it and that keeps building up as your tank evaporates everything else. So let's talk about what it's doing, uh, why we need it, and a lot of really interesting stuff about this particular part of aquarium chemistry. Hello my friends and uh, sorry for the interjection. This is the creator editor obviously and uh, I should say non-editor because I do not have a computer currently that can render over an hour of graphics and video in HD format and then uh, export it off onto the internet. So I made this video in the form of a podcast so that it is an audio uh, based description that hopefully you can enjoy and uh, wrap your head around totally with just the audio while you do a water change or while you're driving to work or hanging out or whatever it may be that you're up to. But if you want a more detailed video of graphics and stuff that you would see in a textbook, images of the phosphate cycle and molecules and the chemical bonds and things, then uh, check out the short form video which is already made, already on the channel. It's about 15 minutes long and I was able to do all of that editing on my phone and so it already exists. However, uh, once I get my teeth taken care of and everything, uh, then I'll have the money to get a new laptop and get all these things in order. So thank you so much for bearing with me and supporting these things, especially these deep dives that take me days and days, weeks to research. Uh, but I think you're going to really like this topic. And you'll have my beautiful uh, fish tank, if I do say so myself, uh, the little ecosystem in my uh, living room to watch if you do want to watch the video uh, while you're here. So uh, thank you so much and on with the show. So let me know in the comments what you think of that and also if uh, you're in the comments I'd love it if you uh, hit that like button if you like these deep dives and uh, subscribe if you're not subscribed and you want to uh, get more content like this I can't do it without you guys 
All right, so Phosphorus, you guys ready? Are you ready to rumble? Are you guys ready to learn? So the normal Phosphorus ratio in blood is only four to seven parts per million in humans. That's pretty low, but it has a massive importance in the performance of the human body and every other body of every other living thing on earth. Phosphorus plays an important role in constructing bones and teeth, exoskeletons, chitin, hair, anything basically that's hard in your body. It is one of the kind of uh, helper molecules and it's an element, but it's also found so often in different forms that are known as phosphates, as I mentioned, that those are kind of, we'll refer to those probably as either compounds or molecules, even though it is really the element of phosphorus that's at the core of all these things. But these phosphates are different kinds of phosphorus-based compounds, usually with oxygen and maybe one or two other things like potassium tied on that either makes them a salt or makes them some other kind of thing. And they do so many different roles within our ecosystems, within our aquariums, within our own bodies. And we're gonna start out by talking about what they do in our body, which also echoes what they do in the body of fish and all complex living creatures, uh, such as fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Then we'll kind of move on to talking a little bit about the overall scene of how it's getting into the soil and where it's coming from, where this phosphate comes from. And then we'll talk about its role in plants and then the ecology in the aquarium and then another kind of holistic overview. And boom, we'll talk about how to treat raising or lowering it in your aquarium and what those uh, various choices will mean for your aquarium. More algae, less algae, uh, better shedding for your shrimps exoskeletons, uh, your fish grow faster, your plants aren't uh, shrunk and uh, stunted in growth, uh, so on and so forth. So back to the human body part of the story. So phosphorus helps maintain that pH level in our blood that is an equilibrium that all animals need to live. You need to have a stable amount. And just like KH and GH are buffers in other systems, uh, phosphorus plays as a role to keeping things acidic. And phosphorus also is a compound that helps with the synthesis of nucleic acids found in DNA. Uh, they enter the composition of all cells in the body without exception and with all animals without exception. Phosphorus helps to filter waste in the kidneys. It helps to bond to many different molecules and then exit the body. And phosphorus is also what causes, along with magnesium and potassium, causes our muscles to constrict contract and, and water and energy and other things are also uh, at play, but it has a major role in constricting our muscles, which includes our heart, because our heart beats due to phosphorus and magnesium and potassium. Phosphorus also helps to regulate and store energy within singular cells, but also within larger systems and organs in the body such as carbohydrates and transferring carbohydrates into ATP or within single cells going into the mitochondria of the cell or the energy making organelle that's found in animal and most cells. And it helps synthesize ATP, that energy currency that's in all living things. And it is then stored or used. Now, ATP is found, as I mentioned, in all living creatures, and it is that kind of universal currency for all stored energy potential other than electrical or kinetic energy in organisms. And phosphorus is also found in foods that contain high percentages of calcium, and its deficiency is actually pretty rare in diets because it's highly available in mo most 
foods such as plants as well as animals that eat plants that we're eating or that fish are eating if they're predatory fish because if those creatures are existing, the mere existence of them necessitates that there's phosphates and phosphorus in their body. They wouldn't exist without it. So the trace amounts needed to exist are fairly plentiful. However, the uh, excess amounts to thrive, and in the case of aquarium plants, uh, and plants in places such as the Amazon, sometimes they face massive shortages, and we'll talk about that a little later. But phosphates are most commonly found in things with high protein and high calcium content, such as meat uh, from protein-rich sources, lean uh, sources of uh, protein such as uh, muscle and uh, other tissue that's lean from uh, deer and uh, uh, from anything from cows to uh, venison all the way into fish. Of course, fish. There's lots of phosphates in fish. It's also found in milk and all of its derivatives, butter and eggs and cream. It's found as well in legumes and nuts, uh, also found in most beans, and it's found in things like peanuts and peanut butter. So let's discuss phosphorus the phosphorus cycle as it applies to our plants and geology at a global scale. So to discuss this, we kind of need to talk a little bit about how it's tied up in the earth. And it is tied up in the earth, phosphorus, in the form of sedimentary rocks. Now, going back to elementary school or back to high school geology, uh, perhaps, you may recall that sedimentary rocks are rocks formed by ground up other rocks. So it's everything from mud and clay and even the shells and broken little bits of, uh, you know, bodies from uh, mollusks and different crustaceans at the bottom of the ocean and under the pressure of the bottom of the ocean or underneath uh, layers and layers of substrate and dirt this then gets pressed over eons of time and over millions of years the these sediments and silts get pressed into actual minerals and stones and that minerality it can be anything from a quartz or a crystal that forms or it can be salt it can be uh, calcium or it can be phosphate or phosphorus now phosphorus is what's usually found bonded with oxygen even in its uh, forms as a mineral because it's very unstable and if you've ever seen phosphorus exposed to moisture or even the atmosphere with any amount of humidity over about 5% humidity, it catches on fire like crazy. And that's why it's actually used in uh, military applications as a bright, bright flare or tracer. So in terrestrial ecosystem, plants grow off of this sedimentary rock and over time it weathers and even though these uh, deposits may have formed by creatures with phosphates in their body and calcium in their body dying and falling to the bottom of the ocean and millions and millions of years this piles up and then layers of it press down on one another, well then over time plate tectonics shift the continents and the bottom of the ocean can shift all the way up to the top of the Himalayas. It's why we find seashells at the top of Mount Everest. All the way at the very peak of Mount Everest, there are actual fossils. And it's because that continental plate has lifted that high due to uh, drift, continental drift and plate tectonics. Now, if we look at how that works then, we can see that any place there's been a seafloor or a rich uh, aquatic environment uh, that's fresh water that has lots of life and biodiversity, we will find these phosphate deposits. Really only deserts or really, really ancient igneous or uh, also known as volcanic rock that's formed by lava is going to be uh, free of it. And the only way it really breaks free of this system of being 
created in sedimentary rocks at the bottom of the ocean or buried under a landslide perhaps you know if a whole herd of bison was buried over time all that's left is going to be you know your constituent carbon and calcium and the oxygen the methane all those things uh, come out as gases or they turn into fossilized forms of things well phosphates are basically the fossilized forms of the phosphorus compounds left in these creatures and any place that's rich in biodiversity millions of years ago will will be captured as a time capsule in stone and it's generally a pretty soft stone actually so it erodes very quickly and everything from wind to rain to hail and sleet and ice uh, freezing and thawing causes this to break up and then get blown into the wind and so phosphates and phosphorus in various forms end up spreading all throughout different ecosystems however there are some ecosystems that have been rich biodiverse ecosystems for an incredibly long period of time and they have basically sucked all the phosphates out of their ecosystem so some places in southeast asia and specifically most people may have heard of the fact that farms were very very hard to uh, get up and running and to have fertile agriculture in the Amazon because there's barely any phosphorus in the soil of the Amazon because it gets processed and picked up and integrated into actual organisms almost instantly when it's found in the environment, be that through trees or aquatic plants or microorganisms, little bacteria that are eating these things. and that makes it so that it is going to need to get its phosphorus from other places and we'll talk about that a little bit later but here's a hint it comes all the way from the sahara in the wind and in the nucleation point of each drop of water every raindrop has a speck of dust or sand or silt in it and there is so much vapor water vapor moving in the form of clouds over the entire uh, Atlantic Ocean in the jet stream and various other uh, pathways that the one that comes from the West African uh, continental uh, edge it actually fires up in thunderstorms and reaches massive heights of 40 to 50,000 feet in the air and those little specks of dust in the water particles freeze as ice crystals and create thunderstorms and actually the hurricane season that spins off that West African coast and ends up crashing into the Bahamas, the Caribbean and into America, the North America every year, Mexico and the United States. That is all actually a easy way to predict how bad the hurricanes are going to be is by how much dust is in the air due to sandstorms in the Sahara that then cause lightning storms at the mouth of the river delta at the Niger River Delta and the Congo River Delta and then all the way those pieces of debris and dust are carried all the way down on the southern part of that wind pathway down into the Amazon and literally there is more water flowing in the sky every year above the Amazon rainforest than there is water flowing out to sea in the Amazon rainforest which is mind-blowing when you think at the scale of all these things. So, as I said, the phosphorus is tied up in the earth and in our rocks. Well, in the rocks, it then leaches into the soil, it breaks down, and usually it's not going airborne right away. Only massive storms in very fine, sandy locations is where you're going to have that happen. And thank goodness it does, otherwise the Amazon wouldn't have much life going on. However, anywhere where there's death and decay, there's also phosphate entering a cycle. In our aquariums, we kind of have a closed loop, and we basically just build up the phosphorus and the phosphates in our aquarium because we don't have a way to get rid of it short of cutting the plants or changing the water, and that's when it's suspended in water. Likewise, when it settles at the bottom of the ocean, the only way it's going to escape that cycle is if an animal such as a whale or a dolphin or fish 
get brought out of the ocean and onto land or wash up onto land and they die. And then the phosphorus and phosphates in them will become fertilizer for plants in the soil up on land. Now, this is why farmers for millennia have been burying fish and fish waste as well as bat guano and and bird guano from islands off the coasts of the oceans around the world. They've been using that super strong b bat and bird guano, that white mineral that is left behind, to fertilize. And until the 1800s, when they came up with different crop rotation and making ammonia and various synthetic compounds of fertilizers, there was a limit to how many people could live in Europe and live in Asia in these dense cities that were growing in the 17 and 1800s because they couldn't grow enough food. And it was the advent of nitrates and phosphates being utilized in all new ways through chemistry that allowed the human population to explode. So let's talk about how plants are sucking this up from however it ended up in the soil. It ended up in the soil or in the substrate or sediment that is uh, at the root of most plants, whether it's from the weathering or from water washing over it and leaching. Sometimes it's through mining or volcanoes that are explosive and ash, or it could just be freshwater lakes and creeks or glaciers uh, that push it around. But it gets pushed around, it ends up as a sediment, and plants seek it out. Now, what it does in plants is very fascinating because it is very essential in plants because one, it regulates the energy and plants get their energy from sunlight and UV rays, whereas other animals can consume the energy, the ATP, the protein, the carbohydrates, the fat, whatever it may be, of other creatures, other plants, uh, even detrivores get it out of things like wood and other uh, materials that's already processed it for them. Whereas plants have to pull it out of thin air, out of CO2 and oxygen and sunlight. So phosphates are one of the nutrients that they can't do that with. They need to get it out of the land, out of the soil, just like every one else who's not a plant or a fungi would have to do. And because of this, it becomes the limiting factor in a lot of systems. Uh, and when I say limiting factor, plants can grow and be healthy as long as they have all their macronutrients, sunlight, oxygen, CO2, which they make both of those things, but those are byproducts of photosynthesis. But also you've got potassium, you've got nitrogen, and you've got carbon, as well as hydrogen being important too. But the macronutrients are pretty much the potassium, the phosphorus, the nitrogen or ammonia or nitrites, and the carbon. And in carbon, they're usually talking about CO2 as a gas. So all of these things need to be present, and if even one of them is lacking, your plant will fail to thrive. And oftentimes, if a plant is not thriving, it is stunted, and if it is stunted, oftentimes the next step is to be dying. So it is absolutely key that all the nutrients from macro to micro are present for plants to be healthy. Now the micronutrients are a little less important because they can be found in such trace amounts that a plant can function even with very minimal amounts of them. But to have a lush, colorful, and healthy uh, environment in your aquarium, you need all of those things. And uh, in the form of monopotassium phosphate, which is uh, potassium, two hydrogen uh, molecule, or two hydrogen molecules, and a potassium molecule with four oxygen molecules, or KH2PO4, that's monopotassium phosphate, that is a salt that is most commonly found in plants, that it's being picked up in uh, the plant's roots from the soil. And phosphorus plays a decisive role in the metabolism of plants. It regulates intercellular energy balance and 
it is also the thing that is the energy in the ATP, as we already mentioned with all living things. But it's also what helps photosynthesizing occur or photosynthesis happen because it is one of the chemicals needed to transfer light into uh, stored energy. Now, it's also part of DNA and RNA, and it's also part of the cellular wall and membrane. Now, only plant cells have cell walls, and they are not able to open and close without either calcium, phosphate, or magnesium uh, ions to open and close, essentially, these doors that allow them to get rid of waste, to grow and expand, and to uh, take in nutrients. So plants really rely on phosphates for a lot of different things. And phosphates are c consumed in the water if a plant is submerged, but they're usually uh, soaked up mostly through the roots. And by the roots of the plant being surrounded by a thin layer of water uh, on the outside that may only be a few molecules thick of water, that is oxygenated water and oxygenated soil. And then the plant's roots themselves through osmotic regulation transfer different chemicals, whether it be salts or potassium or uh, calcium. They transfer these chemicals, including phosphorus, into the plant through these water channels that move through osmoregulation. Now, algae is also completely dependent on phosphates to grow. And whereas land plants need phosphates and nitrates and potassium and carbon monox or carbon dioxide or monoxide, but they need that carbon in a gas form. And that is how they grow and they can't have a limiting factor missing. Algae is able to have more limiting factors missing proportionally. Now, the same laws apply. They can't be missing everything, but they can deal with less. And so algae can grow when there's phosphorus present and no nitrogen. Whereas if there's phosphorus present and no nitrogen, plants won't grow. And so oftentimes that is when we see algae take over completely in a lake or uh, out in an ocean, and we will see dead zones or eutrophication. Uh, now, within wetlands, uh, the biologically available phosphorus is oftentimes going to be orthophosphate or uh, phosphate and then four uh, oxygen molecules, and it can be taken up by plants, algae, and microbes while the rest is absorbed on inorganic and organic particles. It has a strong affinity for metals such as aluminum, iron, and calcium. That's right, calcium is a metal, and people forget that oftentimes, but it will prefer to bind to these suspended metals and then get into the plants through that in the soil and in the water, suspended and bonded to a metal, then uh, on its own and entering through those ion gates or channels. Now about 10 to 15% of the biologically available phosphorus is taken up by living things and the rest is stuck in sediment or littered within dead debris waiting to become sediment. So only 10 to 15 or one out of 10 molecules of phosphorus in the world are in living things. The rest are all stored in mountains or at the bottom of the sea or in minerals. And this is uh, rather interesting because you'd think we would never run out of it. But oftentimes uh, we can also have to depend on the amount of things like calcium, aluminum, or iron in order to bond with that phosphate or oxygen to bond with that phosphate, which isn't gonna happen deep in the core of the earth where pressure has separated these things out into forms they wouldn't be in in atmospheric conditions. And so therefore, it becomes a little rarer. And in order to get it primed and ready to be used as an organic uh, molecule that 
things like plants or animal cells can use, it needs to be in the right conditions and bonded to the right things. Now in alkaline soils with high calcium content, uh, it is a great uh, stable long-term thing and it will stay there as long as it's not eaten by plant roots. Uh, however, in acidic soil, not so much. It is not so stable and it can be eaten up by other things like bacteria or it can bond to different things. Now this involves the release of phosphorus from sedimentary particles to the interstitial water and then to the overlaying water columns. Uh, and this process is mediated by iron molecules. So reducing bacteria that convert iron into oxidized iron or ferric iron uh, releases phosphorus into the environment. So as rust is being made, it oftentimes unleashes the, the uh, phosphorus that was locked up together with it. Uh, and sulfates are uh, reduced from their iron compounds or their other metal compounds by bacteria and turned into new minerals this way. Now in soils with high pH, it is present in forms like the compound of calcium phosphate that are insoluble. So aquatic plants have adapted to absorbing sufficient amounts of short supply insoluble phosphate. For example, they have uh, a very thin cuticle, cuticula uh, or protective layer on the cell wall that I was talking about, the opening and closing gates, that limits water loss on terrestrial plants. But in aquatic plants, it opens up the gates and allows those nutrients that are bonded, uh, the phosphates that are bonded to other metals to enter. But this can cause a buildup of heavy metals, and so plants can't do it, uh, you know, with no abandon. They can't do it just as much as they need phosphates. They can only do it until they are basically full of their uh, daily quota, so to speak, of those metals that it's bonded to as well. Now, at any latitude, at any longitude, climate, elevation, you can find deposits of ancient Phosphates, And that's because, like we talked about, uh, even atop Mount Everest at 30,000 feet or 10,000 meters, you've got phosphates that are waiting to be eroded by wind, ice, water, rain. And they sit there, sometimes trapped for 300, 400, 500 million years in fossils and ancient seafloors and mineral uh, deposits. And when they're freshly deposited in rich ocean sediments, uh, they're still concentrated metabolically, but bacteria and other microorganisms are still working with them while they're forming into these large deposits that are considered inorganic once they're locked away like that. Now, they're found in lots of different diverse locations, but as I meant mentioned, if it's an area that hasn't on undergone a lot of geological change, uh, specifically a section of a continental plate, like for instance the Amazon itself, even though if you put your finger on the globe you would see that the Amazon has moved and evolved and that the Amazon actually used to flow the other way and that South America was part of Africa and Gondwana, the ancient supercontinent, uh, the actual rainforest has been there for at least 60 to 100 million years and life has also been there right on the equator or near the equator and therefore places like this a lot of times get robbed of the phosphates because it's in the living biota and whereas the rest of the world 90 percent or 85 percent of it is in the ground waiting to be used places like this it's flipped the other way and it's in the living things and so living things learn to make use of the phosphates that are there so this is why you find things like plants that eat other living creatures or plants that eat other plants bladder warts and venus flytraps and pitcher plants all sorts of interesting evolutionary things it's not just for a lack of photosynthesis but it's also to sequester 
phosphates, which are limited in some of these very biodiverse uh, regions. Now, another major reason for an area to lack phosphates in modern day ecosystems is because of man-made dams and locks and reservoirs, which are blocking the flow of sediments down river. Uh, and not to mention all other organic nutrients like nitrogen, nitrites, ammonia, uh, calcium, uh, you name it, any of the key macro and micronutrients. And in the Amazon, they're also damming parts of that river, they're damming parts of African rivers like the Nile, and parts of the Congo River system uh, are slated for uh, being dammed, as well as places like the Mekong and the Meklong River in Asia, they're being dammed. And we're seeing that the phosphates that used to flow out of the Himalayas and down all the way to the coast and into the ocean and turning back into sediment, yet again at the bottom of the ocean, they no longer stop and get deposited during floods in the farm fields and in the agricultural areas and forests along rivers uh, from that waterway. And now China is looking to try and appease the Vietnamese in that case by actually bringing in a uh, phosphate mined at the top uh, of the world up in the Himalayas and to scatter it uh, uh, around these fields artificially because it's no longer coming the natural way. Uh, and because of all this and the complexity of this natural cycle, which as you can see, there are many ways for this cycle to either suddenly stop or for it to kind of break down in the sense that, you know, bat guano, oh, all of a sudden the phosphates exited the, the bird or the bat and now it's on a rock out in the middle of the ocean. Or it went all the way from the top of a mountain, got blown into a river as dust, and it's going straight back to being locked away for millions of years. Or it can get blown up in the air and go land in the Amazon and be circled around in living things where every few months or every few years it's in a new living creature or a new life form. And because of all this, it gets pretty complicated uh, what, where it is and what it's doing and how much of it is needed for life to function properly. And in our aquariums, there's no exception to that. And it's become kind of a, an element in our aquariums that's oftentimes just kind of overlooked because as I said, it's rare to have such a deficiency that, that the creatures won't grow, but it is possible. And when that happens, you'll see uh, both stunted fish and plants, but usually you'll see it in the plants long before any fish. And it's also kind of rare to have such a high amount that it's toxic in its own right. However, in large amounts, it causes that algae to bloom because the algae can utilize it before the, the macro fights, uh, as they're known, or macro uh, flora. And that by macroflora, I mean anything other than seaweed or uh, algae or kelp or single-celled algae floating particles. So what we think of as aquatic plants or terrestrial plants, that's macro fauna. And in these two main sectors, uh, you can see that it's used and utilized very differently in natural bodies of water uh, versus where it's been used agriculturally to spread on top of things. And detergents are another place where uh, phosphates get used because it bonds a, a very well to certain chemicals and properties that, that are hard to get out other ways. It has been used as a detergent in you know laundry as well as industrial uses for hundreds of years as well. And the two main sectors uh, that, that, that do this are the main cause of eutrophication that we see in water, whether that's massive eutrophication at the mouth of the Mississippi River in the salt water, or whether that is places like the Great Lakes uh, that have massive spots where there's no oxygen, there's massive uh, cyanobacteria, or uh, 
or as it's known, uh, blue-green algae, sometimes it's called, or an algae blooms, and all of a sudden that algae and cyanobacteria sucks all the oxygen out of the water. It also creates a shadow and a thick, scummy layer uh, on the water, and all the plants are then outcompeted by it, and then oftentimes bacteria blooms to break down the algae and the cyanobacteria. And then the death of those plants releases nitrates, nitrites, ammonia, if that wasn't already in the fertilizers that are running off of farms uh, and off of places where humans have artificially placed this stuff because it's washing out in the water, down the rivers. And the same reason why it gets locked away, and we had situations like the Dust Bowl in the 1920s here in America, where soil became so dry and, and uh, lacking of fertilizers, it was because crop rotation wasn't happening and uh, nitrogen-fixing plants weren't rotated in, as well as phosphates were not, n not being introduced in the proper way. And pretty soon, once fertile valleys and prairies uh, and grasslands were turning into dead zones on land as well. But we see it in the water more often now because the last hundred years or so, we've gotten a pretty good handle on where it's needed on land to uh, fertilize uh, crops. Now, oftentimes the cyanobacteria that's growing in these eutrophication zones are also full of toxins in their own right, cyanotoxins. And while there are some good uh, blue-green algaes, such as spirulina, that's considered basically a superfood, uh, there are many that are harmful, that have all sorts of bad effects on the quality of our health, such as neurological uh, toxicity and poisoning uh, aspects that lead to more things dying in the water. And then oftentimes that washes up on the beach and those same macrophytic plants and animals uh, get washed up like dead whales and fish and uh, anything from, you know, large pieces of um, sea grass and, and uh, eel grass to trees, uh, they end up piling on and when that has been broken down in the water by these dead zones, you end up with the toxins. And also, like I said, it bonds with metal. So the phosphates that are there also bond with metals, including some heavy metals like mercury and lead if it's around. And so you get this basically worst case scenario of the perfect storm of all these bad aspects piling on one another. Now, uh, nitrates are common in most living uh, biotopes. Uh, and a lot of people who've researched uh, the role of fertilizers uh, in aquatic plants, they used to think that, you know, phosphates were uh, not good for plants because it would cause algae to grow and then the algae would outcompete the, the, the plants. And so they said that it, it was nitrogen that was needed more than phosphorus and that there was a ratio. Well, it turns out that's not quite right because the early studies that were done, specifically in the US and in Germany in the early 20th century, were usually done in large lakes or in oceanic waters and they would see the worst industrial eutrophication imaginable, washing out from big uh, agricultural regions that had been artificially impacted. And uh, the deeper water depths also reduced the amount of photosynthesis that could happen. And besides that, in deep water, plants don't grow very much. Uh, you've got your algae, your kelp, and your, uh, your large seaweeds and uh, your large algae but you don't have the actual plants like we're looking at here. And since algae is omnipresent in water and can float at just about any depth, it of course was flourishing whenever phosphates and nitrogen was present. And just because when they got rid of the phosphates, uh, it went away, they assumed that that was good for plants, 
uh, that was not the case, and a ratio was not the case either. It turns out that what they need is none of those things to be hitting their limiting factor. So whether it's algae, cyanobacteria, or plants, they all need the phosphates. So there's no ecosystem that should be basically throttled off of uh, phosphates. They all need at least one part per million or at least half a part per million of phosphates in their in their organ tissue and in their plant tissue, in their cell tissue, I should say. Now, also in these studies, it was mainly northern lakes in latitudes uh, where the phosphate studies in the early 20th century uh, didn't take into account the plants, the, the fact that plants died off during cold periods and that surviving seeds would then overwinter or that rhizomes would overwinter and then sprout again in the spring or summer. But all during that time in the spring where sometimes you'd get late uh, frosts and thaws and frost and thaws, the algae could get a head start growing and it just needed to survive in a few cells, especially when we're talking about green water algae or free floating algae rather than clumps of macro algae. So far less phosphate concentrations were measured in water in bodies of water that had higher plant densities, which led to another erroneous conclusion in early fish keeping and, ecolo and ecology that land plants and aquatic plants prefer water with very low phosphate content, which is wrong. Plants actually, it turns out now we know, love phosphates. It's just they need enough nitrogen, enough sunlight, enough micro and macronutrients to utilize that. And oftentimes they're missing one of those and because of this, it is the algae that takes over, which then starts a feedback loop, and then the algae over outcompetes those plants. But it turns out that as long as you have 30 to 50 percent of your substrate planted with plants in a lake, that it will not become impacted by algae naturally in the systems they looked at in the northern latitudes and into the tropical latitudes. There may be some algal growth, but it won't turn into a eutrophied dead zone. That was only seen with human interference and adding, uh, adding of the excess amounts of phosphates. Now, the only uh, case where this isn't true is if there was a volcanic eruption or a landslide, perhaps, where a bunch of mineral phosphate just slid right into uh, water or a lake. But short of that, and very few cases of that, they found that as long as there was enough phosphate in the system, the nitrites, the nitrates, ammonia, the potassium, the calcium, all of it would actually fall into place because those things are also very abundant in living tissues of biodiverse areas, especially if the area already supports 30 to 50 percent coverage of plants. Not to mention that that's plants underwater. You've got plants above water. You've got different canopy levels of plants. And they said that basically it's safe to say that at 40 percent plant coverage, that's the rule of thumb, you don't really need to fear phosphates. Uh, causing massive al algal blooms unless you're adding tons of that inorganic or, or organic, but tons of excess phosphates. Now, phosphates usually emerge as a decompositional byproduct or an organic ballast, as we call it, uh, such as fish poop or food that doesn't get eaten or dying plant material. And it has very different effects in an aquarium versus in a big open ecosystem. It also has different effects in different pH, as we discuss, whether it bonds to heavy metals or light metals, uh, whether it is going to be caustic and end up uh, promoting cyanobacteria growing with it or algae, and also whether it's going to help uh, in salt water help coral, for instance, form and help uh, crabs and other creatures with exoskeletons to form those versus if it's in fresh water, is it going to be helping uh, the plants and also 
um, causing the cell growth and the cell wall stretching uh, that we see in plants. And because there are far less plants in salt water, uh, we can see this part of the freshwater aquarium is very different than the saltwater world. And that's why we're gonna stay talking about freshwater today. Because if we go into saltwater and reef tanks and all that, we could be here for hours and hours uh, going over the details of this, not to mention the feeding of microorganisms that rely on exoskeletons uh, and that are little invertebrates. In normal freshwater aquariums, phosphates really are hard to uh, get to a toxic level, as I said before. However, in a grow-out tank or a breeding tank that's really dense with fish and has almost no plants, or maybe it does have zero plants because you're just growing, I don't know, pleco babies and you, you do a lot of water changes, this is where algae can get the upper hand easily and phosphate levels do matter. So if you have a phosphate level over one part per million and you have no plants, there's a really good chance you're gonna get green water, cyanobacteria, or uh, algae growing in that tank. So whether it's a grow out tank or just a tank that has no actual plants, it only has plastic plants, like a cichlid tank, then it can kind of get out of control and not that it's gonna be toxic or poisonous, but it can cause the, the bacteria to bloom, which then that bacteria and the actual chemistry of phosphate itself wants to bond with four oxygen molecules to be in its stable form. And it will rip that away from water or oxygen in the water. And therefore it will lead to eutrophication within our own aquariums and then lead to more blooms of bacteria and also of cyanobacteria and algae because they can live in the higher CO2 uh, types of environments, whereas our fish will start gasping for air and starving uh, from this. So the phosphate can also get used up so much in an aquascape tank, one like the one you're looking at here that's just absolutely full of fish and plants, uh, because of this massive diversity and the layers and layers of plants, it actually needs constant input of fertilizers, micro and macronutrients to grow. And with, with time, sometimes the plants get trimmed so much and taken out of the top of the tank or water changes get done and the amount of the phosphates that are floating around, they actually get taken out and the tank has a lack of phosphates. And this is where you wanna add phosphorus somewhere in the neighborhood of a tenth of a part per million to one part per million about twice a week to your aquascape tank or to your heavily planted tank. Now, plants can utilize uh, phosphorus once it has bonded in the right ways, once it's in its organic form and not its inorganic form. And they do it through three different ways. And the first of those ways is through storing light energy uh, in, from photosynthesis as uh, sugars and starches. And they basically store up the energy when bonding with these other uh, molecules and they store away in the tissues of the plant. The second way is by when the plant is expanding through the substrate with its uh, roots and the cell walls of the roots, the root cells and rhizomes can grow and gather more phosphates and nutrients from the actual soil. So it actually acts like a magnet because oxygen and water are always surrounding root networks of aquatic but also terrestrial plants. And because of that, the phosphates want to bond with the oxygen around the roots. And while it's doing that, it's then caught in a layer of H2O. Um, and then that gets brought in through osmotic regulation. And the actual third way is that plants can circulate these phosphates and through osmotic regulation, they can then allow water to flow in through these ion channels. And so they can take one cell that maybe say, uh, we're gonna make up a measurement length, but say it's two blee blops long 
Well, it can swell with water to 10 blee blops long. And then because those phosphates are in the water, it can open the door uh, to that little ion gate or that channel and allow the phosphates in all the way 10 times farther away or four times or five times or however much farther away than that root was initially. So this is how plants reach their uh, reach their roots. Like when you see uh, uh, floating plants and you see their roots are just reaching like crazy and growing several inches a day or you see bean stalks growing several inches a day. It's because they have this ability to stretch their cell walls and it without phosphates, it would not be possible. So the ideal nutritional values uh, that are given a lot of times online are 0.1 to 1 milligram per liter of phosphates. Uh, and even higher concentrations are easily tolerable as long as the remaining nutrients are also there in a balanced ratio and that light is there to allow the plants to grow. So even though we are focused on freshwater and phosphates, it should be noted that in saltwater and reef systems, high phosphate levels can actually stop the uptake of calcium in corals and too high of PO4 uh, or uh, that, that we talked about that's in wetland environments as well can negatively affect the growth and health of corals as well as microinvertebrates. Uh, so reef aquarists actually aim for a target much, much lower than one uh, milligram per liter, and they go for 0 0.05 or 20 times less milligrams per liter of phosphates. Uh, so that's why it's much more important in salt water to be testing for this if you're growing corals and keeping up reefs. It also should be mentioned that in aquariums with a focus on shrimp breeding, increased phosphate levels have a reputation of being responsible for failed molts if too high. So to play it safe, shrimp breeders should fall back uh, on the amount of phosphates there and they should measure the values uh, every now and then to see where they're falling on, on that chart and uh, err on the side of the uh, 0.1 to half a milligram per liter uh, phosphate uh, concentration in your aquariums. And that will be plenty for them to have the phosphates they need out of the water so that their exoskeleton can form and they can do all their other stuff but they're gonna be getting the phosphates they need internally for their cellular systems and for their DNA and all those other things we talked about. They're gonna be getting that from their food much more so than their water. Plants are the ones that need to rely on the water for the osmotic transfer, whereas uh, in other creatures that are eating at higher trophic levels, they can just eat the hard work of the gathered phosphates and phos. Uh, phosphorus that's in other places, plants, animals, and uh, even mineral deposits. Um, so there are other options though if you want to uh, reduce phosphates in your aquarium other than just you know adding all the other macros and waiting for it to run out and making sure you're not adding much food or the food that you add doesn't have much phosphorus in it. Uh, and that is to use fast growing aquarium plants of course strong light, and to have all your major macros, your potassium, your CO2, your sunlight, and your nitrogen, nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, depending on uh, what you're trying to do and what system you have set up. Uh, the plants offer additional hiding and spawning opportunities for fish as well, and uh, the plants will also supply oxygen uh, to the rest of the aquarium, stopping it from eutrophying. Uh, which is a really good thing because we don't want it to become a dead zone. So please keep in mind that depending on the aquatic plant's requirements, they need to be supplied with all the necessary nutrients beyond phosphates as well. So having a balanced nutrient profile for your whole aquarium, your micros and macros is really, really important. Uh, and it's where the phosphates get sequestered in different tissues of different plants. And managing all of that can be quite the science if you really get into it. But on a basic level, you just need to know that you need to be aiming for those target levels in the water overall that I mentioned. 
Uh, now, one thing you can also do to prevent it from happening in the first place is don't overfeed and don't let food fall past fish unless you've got a cleanup crew that's going to eat it like shrimp or snails. And you also might want to think about the types of food you feed. Maybe uh, don't feed shelf-stable fish flakes that tend to have lots of phosphates. Maybe don't put a huge chunk of frozen fish food in uh, or, or even whole foods that are good like shrimp or krill or uh, high protein um, live cultures that have been frozen, um, they become phosphate bombs if they don't all get eaten. And even if they do get eaten, it is a big influx of phosphates. So monitoring that and easing it into the system so that your system can absorb it slowly is also another really crucial thing. Uh, so don't just massively feed once a week, you know, feed a little bit all throughout the week because the overfeeding uh, causes the food to go undigested and then it yields even more phosphates. And as you uh, feed your fish and invertebrates, um, you know, they can only consume so much in a reasonable amount of time. So if there's food left after, say, 15 or 20 minutes of you putting the food in there and them seeing it, uh, take it out if you can and dispose of it out in the garden or compost or however you want to. Um, you know, one, two, even three days without food is not going to cause any harm to most fish or any shrimp uh, unless they're brand new hatched uh, shrimp or shrimp or fish. So just keep in mind that adult fish, even juvenile fish, will be totally fine without being fed over and over and over in huge amounts. So feed them in tiny amounts, uh, you know, sparingly. Lastly, you can do water changes or you can do gravel vacs uh, and try to get silt out of the tank that may have more phosphates in it than say the clear looking water. But this isn't super effective. Um, the, the water change is going to be just as effective as trying to gravel vac and you have much more potential or potentially positive bacteria and uh, diversity in your substrate, especially if it's a deep substrate that you haven't been vacuuming. There's a lot more uh, uh, biological filtration and positive things going on at that level being undisturbed than probably any... Uh, Thing you're going to get back from trying to vacuum up all the sediment in between your gravel or that makes up the mulm on the bottom of your tank. So the last thing you can do is put in a phosphorus pad and these are pads that have chemicals in them that just like metals and other things we talked about, salts and things, uh, and oxygen, they bond to phosphates or they actually can kick off the bonds from metals and switch them so they kick out one and they stick to the pad themselves. Uh, so you can get these at a lot of aquarium stores. I know Aquarium Co-op sells them by my house. Uh, and it's usually a green uh, pad, kind of spongy or foamy. It looks like a, like a kitchen sink sponge. And you can cut it down to size and put it in your filter uh, or just put it in your tank. A lot of times people put this as well as anti-ammonia uh, or ammonia uh, sequestering cubes of material uh, in fish uh, bags when shipping them as well. So these are the ways to deal with excess amounts. The way to deal with not enough is obviously just adding more phosphates or feeding them more uh, fatty and high protein foods and uh, allowing that all to work its way through the ecosystem. But that is the gist of it. That is the phosphate cycle. That is how phosphates are used in plants, animals, and how they work their way through the ecosystem from the tallest mountaintops to the deepest Marianas Trench deep at the bottom of the ocean and the ideal levels uh, for a freshwater tank, which once again are between one and half a part per million uh, or one and half a... Uh, milligram per liter and they can be as high as 10 in a very very active tank that's full of plants but you want to have your tank planted 30 if not 40 is really the golden rule 
40% of the surface area when looking down at your tank should be covered by plants if you not want to not have to worry about phosphates. Now, because there's slow plants like Anubius and Bucephalandra and things like that, that rule isn't a hard, fast, hard and fast rule, but essentially, if you're looking down and it's all Anubius and sword plants and slow growing plants, uh, you should probably include stem plants or floating plants because they're going to be able to uh, process it a lot more and metabolically they go through phosphates a lot more. And likewise, you're going to have to remove them or trim them a lot more, but it's all in the name of growing more beautiful, healthy looking plants and having happy, healthy looking fish while not having an algae explosion or a cyanobacteria explosion. So I hope you guys enjoyed this deep, deep dive. I consulted with lots of different friends and experts on this one. And I was a little torn with how deep to get into the chemistry. So I'd like to know, you know, do you guys like this level? Was it a little over the top? Did it kind of drift into obscurity a bit? Or are you guys game for it? So let me know in the comments. It also let me know that you guys made it to the end. And that means more than anything to me. I have to thank you guys so much, uh, whether you are viewers, subscribers, or channel members. Members, I can't do this without you. I can't spend days of my life researching these subjects without you. And uh, if you think that this is the way we should be doing things on the channel, uh, how about we get the comment, the secret word, so others will know what you're up to, that you made it to the end, that you're a fish nerd of Foss Fate, spelled F-A-T-E, Foss Fate. Uh, include that somewhere in your response in the comments. It would mean the world to me. <laughs> uh, and share this with someone if you think they'd like it. Uh, and remind them that it could be in the form of an audio cast as well if they're interested. Because we're going to try to do things that way. Video, visual and audio from here out. So, thank you so much for coming. I will see you guys next time. Have a wonderful day. And I'll see you on the next episode of Fish Tree.